that you're an A student, didn't get a practicum, so their response to you was, Leslie? You did withdraw. You I said, can I just continue these three classes? And then when it revolves around again that the, I need to take this class because it's done every year at this time, I could just take that class and move on. And I was told, no, you need to withdraw completely. Thank you for joining us for another edition of the Watching Adams podcast. I'm Danny Ladoni here with Leslie Martinez. She actually completed her undergrad degree at Adams State University and then went on to the grad program in a master's of counseling degree. Though she was doing very well academically, found herself in a situation where she couldn't get a practicum. She needed a practicum to complete the program and was basically told to withdraw from the program rather than attempt to secure a practicum, Leslie talks about both the financial and health problems that she incurred as a result of this issue at Adams State. And we go on to talk a little bit about Adams State's failure to work as a Hispanic serving institution that really recognizes students like Leslie who are non-traditional, who are first in their family to receive a college degree, and who are of Hispanic descent to actually meet the benchmarks in order to succeed, rather than telling them that they aren't a good fit and to withdraw. All that and more on this edition of the Watching Adams podcast. Well, my name is Leslie Martinez. My major in undergrad was sociology with the criminology emphasis in psychology. I also got certified for a certified addictions counselor in the state of Colorado. Can you tell me a little bit about being a non-traditional student, the path that you took to get your undergraduate degree, and what led you to decide to enroll in a master's program at Adams State? Okay, well, coming from a sixth grade education, I started my education path because I had come out of an addiction head, because I had come out of domestic violence personally. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Boulder County. I was born in Pueblo. And I then moved to Denver, left home at about 13, and just found my way. And then at 40, when I found myself pregnant <laughs> all over, there I was again, a non-traditional mother, decided to take the path as an untraditional student. So you kind of emerged from difficult circumstances, decided to get an undergraduate degree. How did that go for you, and where did you study? Well, I studied at CCD in Denver and then came to Trinidad because I needed the support systems of my family that have been in the San Luis Valley for many years and decades. Then I graduated as first in my family. So you're the first in your family to yes. get a college degree? Yes. That was a pretty big deal. What was your degree in? It was in sociology. I had a dual degree in sociology with the criminology emphasis and psychology. And where did you actually get your degree? I hit at Adams State. You started at community college in Denver. Uh -huh. Then you made it down to uh, Trinidad, Trinidad State, State Junior College. And then you finished your four-year degree at Adams State University. Yes. Within six years. And what year was that? That was in 2015. All right. So in 2015, you sounds like you had all this momentum going for you. You completed this undergrad degree. And then did you decide right away to go to grad school? Yes. I went right into grad school because I was so excited about Adams State. They had, you know, supported me and cheered me on through all of my volunteer activities and through all the different leadership roles I had and my education that I was, you know, one of their alumni. And of course, I wanted to give them my graduate numbers also. So you um, had a really good experience in undergrad overall? Yes, I had some great professors. Awesome. And I really enjoyed my undergrad. So by that standard, it would only make sense that you would want to take a graduate program at Adams State? Exactly. Tell me about um, how that started for you and then maybe some of the initial challenges. Started out kind of rough, yeah. It was, it was, an, it was nowhere where I thought. And it would be. I had envisioned it being much like my undergrad with, you know, professors that actually, you know, met you where you were and helped you grow. 
versus the way it was where the professors were picking at all the different things that were wrong with me and that I needed to change. So it sounds like you kind of went from an undergrad that was a very kind of supportive and nurturing environment to a grad school program that was much more critical. Yes. Now, some people would say that that's uh, somewhat expected. I certainly got the impression that grad school would be more stringent. Was that just not presented to you? Like your expectations were different than what you Well, the stringency I expected. The stringency you you expected. The the study, the challenges I expected. But when it came down to a person, personal criticism. That was what I didn't expect because all the trauma I had lived prior to my education, I then again felt re-traumatized by their criticism and their critical view of my culture, of me, of, you know, all the way down to the way I did my hair. So let's break that down a little bit. You just used a really powerful word. You talked about this as re-traumatizing. Yeah. Um, so can you describe a specific experience or two where you felt like your yourself as a person or your culture, as you said, were critically assailed or traumatized? Well, yes. Um, one was because I had blonde hair. And I was told that people... So you dyed your hair blonde? Yes. Okay. And um, so I was told, I was called into the office and told that with my blonde hair that I needed to tone it down because I would not be taken seriously in the field. And this was someone that was supervising your practicum? Or yes. Who? Okay. That was super, super, my, one of my advisors. Okay. So one of your advisors told you, you can't dye your hair blonde. No one will take you seriously. Right. Well, she says I, my hair was already dyed, so it wasn't that I cannot. It yeah. was that I needed to change it. The other thing was that my eyebrows, because I have a scar in the middle of them, I had always shaved them. And so I wore makeup to, you know, make my eyebrows. And so it was like, well, I know that's a cultural thing, but you need to have, you know, grow your eyebrows. And I'm looking at her like, why would you pick on this and then call it cultural when this is something I do because of my scar? So it has perhaps a cultural element. Many Hispanic women will will either shave or trim their eyebrows and then pencil them in. Right. I'm not a, a beauty expert here, right. but this is what and I understand. That is, that is precisely what she was targeting. But in your case, it also had a cosmetic function that was uh, the basis of a scar that you had. Right. Do you think she knew that? Well, when I explained it to her, she just says she she was oblivious to it. And I think she thought it was an excuse. You know, looking back on it, I feel that they were trying to pick at me thinking I was being vain when actually it was my self-confidence that they were trying to beat up. Because, you know, so often... When girls are self-confident, they're looked as, at as conceited or vain. But for me, once I was able to empower myself, I became very confident. And I, my self-esteem is not an issue anymore, which sadly people look at as conceit. You know. What's really just um, disappointing in general is that here you are, a non-traditional student who's made it into a grad program, and you're being pulled aside to talk about not what your academic performance is, but what you what you look like, how you dress, and that's that's I think a challenge for women at any stage of their profession. They're they're kind of picked apart for what they wear, whether it's right or not right, rather than how are you doing at your job, how are you doing in your program. Right. So that was one issue. What happened from there? I did finish that semester. The next semester, we're going into practicums. And I had changed everything they want. I had even taken my Christmas money. My son went without Christmas that year to buy the clothes necessary so I could fit in their cookie cutter um, position. So and just as a review, you, um, you secured a practicum. Can you tell us a little bit about what a practicum is? Okay. A practicum is when you, it's almost like an internship. You're practicing your field. When the people, the sites came, there was only a few that were able to secure a practicum. 
the ones that hadn't really conformed, I viewed, did not get a practicum. And we had one of the largest classes. So you had a large class. Uh -huh. There were a limited number of practicums. Yeah. This is in counseling, right? Right. So are these all kind of clinical settings where you actually are working with people that are receiving some mental health treatment? Or what, what is that no, practicum? No, and in um, our region, actually in our rural setting, there is not enough clinical positions for the class we had. So they had went outside the box and secured positions in the hospital at our nonprofit organization here. So it sounds like rather than focusing specifically on counseling. It was case management. Because the San Luis Valley is such a small population, right. there's not enough you know, practicums of that nature. So they're putting you in related fields in, in physical medicine, or, in social work, in yes. case management. Yes, those kind of positions. Which sounds like it's a, a challenge or maybe not a good fit anyway. But even at that, maybe you could make the most of it. But you were not able to get a practicum. No, because um, I'm not sure how the practicums were given, but I definitely could tell I didn't get a recommendation because even people with less experience and less credentials than me did get a position. Wow. Okay. So what you're describing is an application process to yes. get a practicum. Yes. You saw what you perceived to be were people that had less experience, people that had fewer qualifications, but were accepted into a practicum that you weren't. Yes. Would you say that, that the reasons had to do with your appearance, with your age, gender, um, cultural background? What do you think? I feel like a lot of them played a part more so in the recommendation because Adam State employs somebody that is supposed to be key in, you know, getting these practicums filled for their students. Um, I also feel that at the beginning of the semester, they knew how many students they had. So it should have been this person's main focus is to get these practicums. So they realized they probably didn't have enough available for the number of yeah. students. And just um, taking a step back, how important is the practicum to receiving your degree? Um, how it's important key. is it? It's, it's key. key. So it's yeah. kind of a requirement that exists a little bit outside the purview of the program. So it's this bottleneck that everyone has to kind of pass through. Right. And once again, I can't um, say enough, knowing that there's going to be this many students thinking outside of the box, had I been in that position, I would have looked out for the for corrections for social services through the probation system through mental health there are plenty of avenues for them ha to have covered everybody. And it sounds like a supply and demand problem. Either you have to get more practicums available in order to meet the demand of your students, or you just have to decrease the supply of students that get accepted right. into this program. You know, like, exactly. Do you have any idea how large your class size was? It was 22. So you were in a cohort of 22 students. We had only lost two students the first semester. So it's a two-year program, and it's a, it's a two-year program. And you were about a year into it, would you I say? I was a year. Into okay, so you were halfway through the program. You didn't get your practicum secured. Do you reapply, or what happens next? No, well, this is what happened because I had four classes and I was quite successful in the three of them. It was just the practicum that I didn't have my. So you you my do site. get an incomplete, or what? What does that look no, like I was on paper? Told I needed to withdraw. From the program? From the program. Wow. And so you were doing well in your other classes. Would you mind telling me about what your grade point average was? or how At you that point, I had been maintaining A's in the, all the classes and even in the coursework for the practicum. And so you're an A student, didn't get a practicum, so their response to you was, Leslie? You need to withdraw. You I said, can I just continue these three classes? And then when it revolves around again that the, I need to take this class because it's done every year at this time. I could just take that class and move on. And I was told, no, you need to withdraw completely. So it sounds reasonable that if you just didn't get your practicum this time, you could finish the classes you're in, reapply next time. Doesn't seem like it's a big burden on anyone. Uh -huh. Might be a little bit of a disappointment, but we all you know, have setbacks. Right. And they told, they told you that you could not do that? Yeah, I could. Were you forced to withdraw? I or was. So you were forced to withdraw as an A student. Yeah. Any other factors? 
that I'm not identifying in this interview for listeners thinking, this just doesn't add up. This is crazy. It doesn't. And it doesn't add up. And I got physically ill because of this. It was such a setback because I had already lived through the re-traumatization and still was going to go on and be like, okay, I will fit into your mold and just do because at the end of the day, I just need my master's to go on to my PhD program, which I also wanted to do here. So your first hurdle was you need to change your look, you need to change your clothes, <laughs> etc. Your your son uh-huh. went without Christmas money uh-huh. so that you could buy a new wardrobe to be able to continue on with this practicum so that you could achieve this degree that you're working toward a master's in counseling. Uh-huh. And then you don't get the practicum anyway. Even though you have A's in all your other classes, right. they tell you that you were forced to withdraw. Yes. And so I withdraw and I get into another program really quickly. Another program at Adam State? No, I had to go to, I went to Denver with and got into a master's program there. And I'm telling them, look, I do not have the funds because now they're charging me for those classes they forced me to drop out of. So let's take this in two parts. First is the academic component, which is you're a year in. Is it easy enough to transfer a year into a master's program to another Um, school? I was forced to have to start all the way over. So you had to start over, which then gets us to our financial component. (laughs) Right. I mean, this this is, it, it would be funny and absurd if it weren't so sad. So now you have all of this, I assume you took out loans, or how were you financing your master's degree at Adams? Um, I was on the the FAFSA, the student loans, and and when you're a graduate student, you solely have the support of loans. You don't have any grants. So there's no Pell Grants or things like that for master's programs. So you were taking out federal subsidized student loans. Can you give me an estimate about how much you had in debt to um, the loans you were taking out? For that first year, it was 4000 is what I had to pay back. It was like between four and 5000 When I talked to him, I said, I, I can't afford this. I'm a student and a single mother at that. Now, your plan had been, once I take out these loans, but I, I get this degree, I can work in my field and pay them off that way? Like, yes, you'd exactly. intended to pay off these yes, loans with a degree? Yes. Yeah. I intended to do that. I also de- intended to be in a no- non-profit organization and give back to the community. So not only was this education going to pay off my loans, but it was going to pay the community that it embraced me sure. and supported me to get this far. So you saw a real need in this community. You thought that with this degree, you could work toward filling that need, uh, giving back to the community, being able to pay off your loans. Then you were forced to withdraw from the program. You had the loans still to pay back. And now you had to, you moved to Denver initially to start over? No, I went online. You were doing this online from yeah. Alamosa. Okay. Yeah. Now that, well, that's exactly what I'm having to do. You were finishing your degree where? I'm now in having to move north um, to, I'm moving to the Greeley area for my son's sake because Denver eats up children. But I will be studying and doing my master's and doctorate work in Denver and commuting. I wish, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. But had I really did my homework and not just been so loyal to a school that had been so good to me, had I just went with the hardball view, I probably would have made different decisions. You know, the, uh, the theme of having your loyalty not reciprocated is a theme that I've heard in many of the interviews that we've done, certainly also in my case. In retrospect, were there things that you could see being changed or fixed so that this doesn't happen, so there aren't more people like you who get so invested and then by some design problems aren't able to secure the practicum or some other element to get a degree? I mean, what's really going well, on here? I feel like... more transparency should be. What would you have wanted to know? I would have wanted to know that you need to secure your own practicum. Did an admissions counselor or your supervisor or anyone else, basically what I'm asking is, did you feel like anyone else within Adam State was on your side? At that point, no. There was nobody. 
So you didn't have an advocate. You didn't have a a, a guide to no, say, "Hey." No, because the advisor was the one that told me I had to change. So it doesn't it doesn't serve you well to talk to the advisor because at that point it felt like my worst nightmare because they were all me against the world because they held my degree or the keys to my degree. And if I talked badly about any of them, then I was bucking the system in which it was just a cycle. So they were kind of holding you hostage. Financially and educationally, they had yes. the components that you needed to move on with your life. They were treating you in ways you felt were unfair. Uh-huh. And there wasn't a lot of recourse to get out of that no, cycle. Not- and the, the sad thing is, Adam State, like most schools, will tell you that they're student-centered, that the focus is on the, the learning outcomes and the success of the student. So I guess my question is, is, has since that happened, you had some major health problems, you had all these financial issues, you just had a lot of logistical headaches. Has Adam State reached out to you in any way to try and make things right or to resolve things? Not once. Not once. So what happened to the debt that you had? Um, it went to the creditors. I still owe that debt as well as the, it's like a double debt because not only do you owe that debt to the college, you owe that debt to your subsidy loan. So here you are, you're, you're in a state of ill health. Would you mind sharing just a little bit about what you were dealing with? Well, what happened is I had, um, I was under so much stress and my hair started falling out. And everything was hurting me, and then I completely lost my ability to walk. And I had a complete renal failure. I was taken out of here by Flight for Life, and I was in the hospital for like four weeks. So, Flight for Life... You were in renal failure, Uh which basically means that your organs stopped working properly? They were shutting down. Okay, you couldn't walk. Uh And Adam State, meanwhile, is sending your bill to collections. Uh So you're having a collections agency hound you for money that you don't have, that you're not really in an ability to get. Or even just even comprehend what is going on at this point. Is it fair to say that despite your best intentions, it seems like this grad program at Adam State became one of the the biggest hardships or mistakes in in your recent adult life? Yes, it was definitely one of my turning points. Um, I've rethought again where I put my loyalties because, you know, it brought up major trust issues in any kind of steps you make. And you definitely, because the valley is not what you know, it's who you know. Sadly, if you're an outsider, you get outed really quick. You're an easier person to get outed if you're not connected. And even if you were an insider, like you had earned your undergrad here, it seems like you were part of the community. You you very quickly found yourself cast out. Right, because, and, you know, I give that because I'm very transparent in what my intentions are. My intentions are not to teach. I did not want to be a teacher. I wanted, I'm a, I'm an entrepreneur and that in itself lends to how I wanted to help the community by opening my own, you know, residential treatment center. So if you you could, if you could go back and give advice to your former self as you were graduating from undergrad, or just what you would say to a student that's considering the master's counseling program or Adam State in general, what advice would you give them? I would definitely get anything in writing. Second, I would not do my bachelor's in one place and then get my master's in it because if anything happens in your master's, your bachelor's is tied down. When I went to the next college to apply. So you were getting out of Adam State. You were looking to apply. Was this the University of the Rockies? Yes. Okay. My, they, you need transcripts for your undergrad. Sure, of course. Well, because there was that bill there, they would not release my transcripts for my undergrad, which had nothing to do with my master's. So your undergrad degree was uh, paid for, it it was taken care of, but because you had debt from the grad program that they kicked you out of, Uh you weren't able to get your undergrad transcripts from Adam State so that you could move on and get your degree somewhere else? Yes, exactly. 
How can they do that? It wouldn't seem like they should be able to. At least they should be able to give you your undergrad, which is bought and paid for, and sweat it out. Well, you're, they're the only game in town, and they have your degree in their exactly. filing cabinet. So until what they so get, they hold it hostage until until and they get what they want you from you. You don't even have a degree. Yeah. But now I'm forced to pay for them with no degree when my skill set has come from that college, and they will not attest to it. So it's like, oh, wow. But you, Foresight had me get that, my transcript, my uh, an original transcript. So I, you had earlier than that already gotten an undergrad right. transcript, so you had yes, something. So I did have something, but for other students that don't have that Foresight, that could lead to bad, very so bad. So get students. your undergrad transcript ASAP, because exactly. if you have any falling out with Adam State later, you're going to have a hard time getting it. Right. I would get five of them if I had them. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, let me ask then, do you feel like Adam State was kind of willing to take your money so long as you're willing to pay, but they didn't have the foresight to help kind of direct you in ways that would be effective, or what's going on there? You know, it's like a good old boys club. They're all protecting each other. And nobody is helping the student that doesn't have the benefit of parents that have gone this path before. So as a non-traditional student, as the first person in your family to get a college degree, you were navigating this system before anyone in your family and your support network were doing it. And the people within Adam State that really should be there to help guide you towards success were actually the ones pulling you aside, telling you not to dress this way or not to look this way. Actually setting up barriers as I'm going and not that I had already overcome so many other barriers of just even having a sixth grade education. I had overcome all those and navigated it myself and never had the benefit of any help. Just to clarify, you completed the sixth grade and then I assume at some point later you obtained your GED? Yes. Wow. I mean, that's pretty remarkable. I figured everybody in this world was good and I trusted them. I wasn't being advised along the way. In, in the case of Adam State? Yeah. Okay. I wasn't being advised, and I, there wasn't a transparency saying, Leslie, while you're out there networking, you need to probably be thinking about a practicum site because you're going to have to get one, and you're non-traditional, and we're not going to help you. I might have should have been able to, somebody should have pulled my jacket to that because I would have done that had I known. But you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And you didn't you have go. a program that was helping guide you toward making those decisions. And so then when you didn't, rather than circling the wagons and trying again, they said you have to withdraw. Right. It sounds like you're moving on to a better place now, not thanks to, but despite your experiences at Adam State. So you have a resilience about you, but you can't really attribute Adam State to your success as you move toward your PhD. No. I, I really can't. I've had to learn how to walk again. Just to be clear, no one called or emailed or asked you to meet to say, hey, we understand you're going through a hard time right now. You're having medical issues. You attempted to get into this program and then withdrew because we told, I mean, it just, yeah. it seems like it wouldn't take a whole lot to have tried to reconnect with you as a person, figure out what was going on and help you reorient yourself on the path to success. But when you fell off that wagon, Adam State just kind of kept on going and they wanted your money. Still. And they were holding your undergrad Still. transcripts. I really feel that transparency and actually looking at a student and may meeting them where they are because different people are going to look different. They're going to be different. Their culture is going to be different. But that culture, that look, that person is going to meet somebody at where they're at. When you have to have everybody into this cookie cutter shape, it's not going to work because that person's not going to connect with their type. Let me throw something out at you. Adam State frequently advertises itself as uh, HSI, Hispanic Serving Institution. They talk about their, their cultural mission in the San Luis Valley to serve the community of students who include non-traditional, include first-generation students, include students of Hispanic descent. And uh, here you are kind of fitting all those boxes. Call what me jaded. But I think it's because they consider us the most naive 
and they know they're going to get our dollars, which is what keeps them going. There's not very many Hispanics that graduate out of here. So in other words, though it's a Hispanic enrolling institution. <laughs> it's not a Hispanic graduating institution. I'm not the only Hispanic person that has said this. I know several. Yeah, but one was told to take her eyelashes off. One was told not to wear her makeup like that. You in know? your grad program, or yeah. just well, in the grad program, yeah. Huh? Um, and so, was... when you talk about a cookie cutter mold, that's what you're describing. That these yes. these kinds of appearances are just not. They probably would have been happier if I would have went by my middle name and shortened my name to Martin. It's not good. There was blonde girls in our class. So why were they not told to dye their hair dark? You know, because I was Hispanic with blonde hair. I wouldn't be taken serious. I can name several blonde psychologists that are taken very serious in their profession. So it's not the hair color. It's the fact that with your ethnicity, having dyed blonde hair is just not acceptable. Right. Can we go back just a minute? You said that you felt like Adam State sort of takes advantage of or exploits Hispanic students because it, it sort of assumes that they're they're gullible enough. Well, or what does yeah, that mean? I, I, I don't think it's only the Hispanic students. We have a huge black African-American population here, too. And they're in the athletic department. Pardon the expression, but they're actually being pimped for their athletic abilities because they make no provisions for them in the in the academic arena either. And have you some very think, low completion rates of their yes. degree programs. And you and you look at them and you're looking at these athletes that come here thinking, you know, they're meeting their dreams. They're also for people of color that they have the enrollment numbers, but the graduate numbers aren't there. Or they lose their scholarship midway, and is anybody there to support them, counsel them, help them on their path? Because now this is very devastating. To, you know, we were all there for you when you chose to come here, but where are you now? I have many athletic friends that are also people of color that were not able to even get their undergrad done because they were dropped somewhere in the middle. I think that my tenacity and my resilience is what got my undergrad, but that's not the norm. So if there was something, if Adam State heard this interview and said, all right, Leslie, what can we do to make Adam State a more Hispanic serving institution? What would you say to make Adam State a more welcoming campus for Hispanic students to succeed, for students of color to succeed? It's more than um, having a Hispanic day or just meeting this go to my thing. It's more of finding those first in the family and non-traditional students and saying, here's your support services. More than TRIO. TRIO is great. But more than that, actually taking an individual and having an advisor that understands this plight, that he or she also was in that, that they know what it was like for them. So you this need someone to help as an this. advocate, not necessarily to, to say, hey, you're withdrawn from the program. Right. So, yeah. There needs to be somebody that is not in the club that says, let me help you advance. In other words, someone that looks out for students rather than looks out for the administration, looks out for themselves. Right. You know, not for the institution, but retention motivated for the student because they want to see them be the first time graduate. They want to see them succeed as a non-traditional I've always wondered how different a school like Adam State would be if the federal government on which they rely heavily for the student loan programs and others, if those programs only paid Adam State when the student graduated rather than when they enrolled, right? The culture would change. So instead of you paying on the front end, they have your money and then, oh, you're out of luck. If they had a real financial interest in seeing you succeed, that that was actually more important than letting you drop off the radar. Exactly. I think I've, I've actually thought about that too because I think about wouldn't it be so odd if they did not give single parents those TANF dollars unless they were getting their education? And then wouldn't it be so odd if the educational institute didn't get paid until after that student graduates? In other words, we want some actual results. Yes. Not For just those tax dollars, can we see results? Yeah. You know, we will support you if you're getting going for 
this, if you're trying to move ahead in your life, we will support your education if you get to the end here. And then suddenly what that looks like for Leslie is, oh, geez, we need to help her get into this practicum. We need to help her complete her degree because otherwise, as a student, she won't be reimbursing the school uh, for the enrollment that we counted on her for. And it, not only Leslie, it looks that way for a lot of single parents. But if they were to actually have supported through their education, then we would see graduation rates go up. We'd see healthy, independent, self-sufficient families. We would see so much. But when you get the carrot before you have to walk the journey, then people's motivation is just to get more people. So the incentives aren't aligned. Yeah. Leslie is a warm body. We're going to put her in the classroom. We get some money from her. Doesn't work out. Doesn't matter to us. Leslie's away. back out. We're going to sit on her undergrad transcript until we get paid from her, et cetera. Oh, but I'm sure at one point or other, they're going to approach me on numbers are low. They'll say, you know, come back to Adam State and we will do something with, miraculously with your bill and you could go back into the Grad program. Let me ask at this point, is there anything Adam State could do to make things right, or do you feel like that's behind you now and you've moved on? I'm behind it. It was $4,000 lesson, well learned. Could have been worse. I mean, yeah, I've definitely been. interviewed students who have much more debt from their undergrad and, and nothing to show for it. Yeah, it could have been worse, but it wasn't. It was a tough lesson. I, it was a life lesson, definitely, and a turning point in my life where now I'm in the music industry. I'm going on with my education. I'm doing so much, you know. Had it been for a lot of the adversity I faced, it wouldn't have brought a lot of strength. I built. So I guess I could thank them in that. <laughs> but do I want to get married again? No. no I'm, I've got a divorce from the institution and I, I'm the one that's going to have to pay the alimony, I guess. <laughs> um, when asked by undergrads, I definitely cannot say, yeah, I'll go into the master's. Program. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't advise that. Well, thank you for your time today. I appreciate being able to hear your story, and I wish you the best of success as you finish your degree somewhere else. Thank you.